For most of the time, people come in and I just say useless things at the beginning that everybody already knows, and so that's a good use of the time while people are filing in, and then we have more time uh, for the meat of the talk. So, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, Sugi's five-year birthday party. Uh, Sugi is now five years old. It's been in incubation for a very long time. Um, I don't want to grow up. Uh, I don't want to get out of incubation. I'm very comfortable in incubation, but the product is very mature. I just like, I feel good in incubation. So uh, my name is Charles Severance. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I also work on Sakai. Um, if you want to play along, Mark just handed out a paper copy of a tutorial that is a self-paced tutorial to build a Tsugi tool uh, while I'm talking. So if you feel like it, you could walk through that tutorial. Perhaps now, perhaps later. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Sugi is, uh, Sugi's goal is to create an app store for education and a content repository for education and a whole bunch of reusable next generation digital learning environment stuff. It also focuses a lot on standards compliance. The key to Sugi is we do almost nothing uh, outside of that which the standards enable us to do. And uh, we're increasingly figuring out how to make hosted services. There's another kind of sub-project within Sugi called Koseyu. It's never been spoken publicly out loud until uh, David Bauer mentioned it, that says that they're going to use it. So what Koseyu is, is a learning object repository, and it's a MOOC hosting platform that's a baby little tiny thing that competes in a way with Open edX and uh, Coursera. So Sugi is an app store for education. This is our website, sugicloud.org. I increasingly feel like part, uh, writing open source software, it's not good enough to just have a really cool GitHub repo and some readmes on how to download and install. You actually have to have some kind of a presence for those people who have cloud first as their strategy to be able to use it immediately and not and, and not have to say, oh, wow, I'm going to hire a person who knows all these skills, figure out Amazon, and then I'll start using your thing. I want people to be able to go here, click, log in with their Google ID, get an account, and then plug this into their Canvas. And people do this every day, log in this free server that I, that I support. Um, the whole goal was to enable the quick and uh, building of high-performance learning applications that can meet all the needs. Again, if you saw David Bauer, uh, Dayton uh, talk, uh, that's probably the best example in the world of someone who heard what I was saying and took action on that. Um, I, and David and I are probably the two people in the world that make the best use of Suki. But it's, it is a self-paced uh, learning place. It's, it's itself a MOOC. This is a Koseyu website. You see it has lessons. It's kind of like a lessons and it's got some cards and it has homework and you log in and you get grades and badges and stuff like that. Um, I use Koseyu for um, the supporting of my uh, MOOC classes, my open educational resources. I use it as a publisher to support the book that I publish. And so this pythonforeverybody.com is my vision of what a future, future open course should look like. An open course is really a website that's Googleable and searchable, and then you log in, and then additional features are, in a sense, layered on top of that website. So this is the outline for today, a bit of Django Tsugi, uh, where I'm at with Tsugi PHP, LTI Advantage a bit, uh, Tsugi is middleware, uh, the Tsugi version of Python, and Django Tsugi. So um, I, it seems as though every year I think I'm done, and Tsugi is ready to sort of uh, escape the nest. And I showed Tsugi to some folks from Europe, and they're like, can one Tsugi tool look at the data from another tool. And I said, why would one tool be so rude as to do that? And that, they said, that wasn't really the question. Technically, can one tool, if with bad intention, look at another tool's data? And I'm like, of course. I mean, they're just like in PHP. Why wouldn't, I mean, just don't do that. And so in Europe, they're like, well, you know, we, we are, that really is a barrier to, uh, a barrier to adoption. So I needed to come up with a much more secure way of mixing applications from many, many sources. And so I started building this idea where instead of all the tools running in PHP with all the framework, but instead I build a really simple web service launch and then web service callback so that literally any tool can be written that can talk this little simple protocol. And this protocol is way simpler than LTI. 
And so I built that. And this is the embedded workshop that you're working through, the piece of paper that you're looking at on your desk. You go into a hosted free Python environment, you check out some source code, you connect it into a Sugi server, and then you connect it into a Sakai server, and then you're doing LTI launches. Um, we'll see how far you get, or if anybody even wants to try that. But the idea is it's as easy as I can possibly make it. And so this is the source code for the modern Django-based Sugi application. This doesn't show the HTML, but other than that, it's a complete app thing. It, uh, it basically receives a launch, it shows a page, it takes a, does something that produces a grade, and then it sends that grade back, and it's like, what, 20 lines of Python. And I like Python, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow, how much I uh, like Python, but I think this really reduces the barrier to entry. Uh, we're lucky when we find, in Sugi, we find someone who knows PHP and actually likes it, um, but there's a lot of places that are not ready to learn PHP. It's not a hard step, given that this little web service here is not as hard as LTI 1.1, to imagine that we could eventually support pretty easily any number of application patterns, because now the APIs to talk to these are really thin, really tiny, and they're really just wrapping web services, and all the hard work is running on Sugi, all the Google Classroom and LTI Advantage and LTI 1.1, all that stuff, that's hard. That's the thing that took me five years to build. And so Django is the first thing I'm kind of playing with, but there's nothing saying that I couldn't do this. I didn't dream that I would build Sugi tools in every language, but I was going to build all of this code in every language. That's very different what I'm proposing here. I'm building a really tiny shim in each of these languages, and then off we go. And all the hard stuff is in this sort of Sugi as a service, rather than uh, you put the tools inside here. The old days, I put the tools inside there. And so this is just the sort of the GitHub slides. There's tons of stuff. Probably www.sugi.org is the best place to start. Um, the PHP is sort of the main thing. We got some static assets. There's uh, the, the, <coughs> the, there's the management and hosting tools and Koseyu, and these are some Koseyu sample sites. Um, and we're, we're busy. We got a bunch of servers running, and I'll talk a little bit more about how these all work. Um, and so we're professionally monitoring these things and, and giving folks uh, Tsugis. Virginia, Virginia asked for a Tsugi, so we gave them a Tsugi. Uh, Canvas, Brightspace, and Blackboard, I gave them Tsugis. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the things that are new in 2019 is the emergent, uh, emergence of the Django pattern. Um, and then what I deprecated was these high-level libraries that were basically going to be complete re-implementations of Sugi in these different libraries. Sugi's hard. Um, PHP Sugi takes all my energy. I built, like, these are just sort of starting points for uh, the Java version of a full Sugi and a Node version of full Sugi. And I was hoping that someone who was crazy about Node would finish them. And so Node is like two years old, and like nobody wrote a single line of code. I, what, I did the first 20% of it, and I hoped that like Node crazy people would do that. And they didn't. The same was true for Java. I mean, I showed how you could do it, but I didn't bother finishing it and supporting it, and nobody cared. And so I'm, I'm deprecating those. But that doesn't mean I can't support them with my much lighter weight one big Sugi as service, and then I could do Java or anything, because it's all a little simple web service. Um, there's a thing that I do that very, little pe very few people know, that I have low-level PHP uh, node and uh, Java libraries that are not equal to all of Sugi, but they just, they just implement the IMS protocols in a very raw way. They save you from having to know all the little JSON to write, et cetera, et cetera. And there's people that just adopt Sugi for, for these kinds of libraries. I've got a low-level library in PHP, a low-level library in Java, and a low-level library in Node. And so they're not deprecated. LT Advantage is a profound change in the marketplace. Um, the thing that makes it profound are the scope. There has really never been a standard that's so broad in scope. And there's never been a standard that has been more rapidly adopted by the mainstream learning management systems. And part of the reason that mainstream learning management systems are adopting, adopting Advantage is they really don't like LTI 1.1. It wasn't so much a bad standard. I mean, hard for me to say LTI 1.1 and bad standard in the same sentence. But there was a lot of bad practice around the implementation of that standard, especially some of the tool vendors. 
Um, some of you are fighting with your LTI folks and hoping that they would be more secure, but they just refuse. And so the, 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 the LMS vendors are like, I really don't want to send data to this tool that uses the key in a secret of 000. Or here's a vendor that doesn't even check the key in secret, but accepts the email address as correct information without checking the signature. Literally, there are LTI 1.1 tools that are going to try to be sold to you that that's their security model. Don't check the signature, but ch assume the email address is right. I mean, who's going to send us any data that's bad? I mean, why would anyone even do that? This is at higher ed, and everyone's so nice in higher ed. This is going to be disruptive. It, well, I'll keep talking about how disruptive this is, but um, the, one of the things that happens is if you have a gradebook API and you have a roster service, you kind of don't need a learning management system anymore. A tool can function on its own. If it can get a roster and it can create columns in a gradebook as it sees, the tool becomes the learning management system. And so there's all these roster specifications like EduAPI and One Roster and LIS. I think quietly LTI 1.3 and LTI Advantage is actually going to be the roster, roster standard that wins because it's already present in every one of the learning management systems that matter. It's already there because they wanted the LTI advantage. This is a marketing trick. There's separate standards here, but they say you only get the grade A sticker if you do all the standards. So all the LMS is like, I want the good sticker. I don't want like Sakai to get the good sticker and Blackboard to only get the other sticker. So everybody wants the sticker. And that plus they don't like LTI 1.1 all that much. So it's really excited. Sakai is among the elite, the first LMSs that did this. Uh, we put a lot of effort, a lot of effort over the last year and a half. Uh, Sugi also is uh, certified as LTI uh, one com compliant. Another thing that we're doing is uh, this is the only little mention of my little company, Learning Experiences. Learning Experiences is a very small company that mostly just helps open source to go better. We sponsored this conference. Um, but one of the things we do is we do things that are not as fun, like building Terraform Ansible uh, scripts and uh, recipes to uh, put this stuff together. So the Sugi hosting that I provide, both free and for, uh, for money, uh, is done highly professionally. One of the cool things about this is this uh, Cloudflare and firewall thing. Um, it really means that every Sugi server, no matter how big or small, is in effect immune to denial of service because Cloudflare is the world's largest denial of service provider. And every one of these servers, none of these servers here have an IP address that can even be talked to on the global internet. It has to be proxied through Cloudflare. So if you're DDoSing my servers, you can't even find the IP address of these servers because they're behind a completely blocking firewall. And the only thing that comes through that firewall is Cloudflare. So you can't DDoS. I can have a $5 server, $8 a month Amazon server that can handle the world's largest DDoS attack for free. That's the professional stuff that you do when you're trying to make this real and professional. So the one thing you saw in that status slide was uh, servers for the various LMS vendors. And so as part of my contribution uh, to the, the quality of interoperability between all the vendors. Uh, now that we think the standard's all out, but then as we implement, we're going to still run into practice. And so I have taken the SUGI, I've got sprinted ahead, and I have it implemented. And then I gave Blackboard, Canvas, Desire to Learn, and Moodle, I gave them all dedicated servers so that two things can happen. One is they can do their first interoperability testing, and I have a little SUGI unit test tool for LTI Advantage. They can do all their testing with SUGI, which means that they're going to think that it's their fault if something doesn't work with SUGI. They're going to go fix their LMS. Or maybe they'll find something that's my fault, and then they'll fix it. Um, or they'll tell me to fix it. And so the, it's funny how these are already causing conversations to happen, because there is such an advanced implementation of a tool that is so transparent in how it works and what it does. But I also have been invited to Blackboard, DevCon, uh, CanvasCon and Desire to Learn to speak about LTI Advantage and SUGI. And so I need to do like workshops at all those, and I don't want to use the workshop server that I'm using with a password of Sakaiger at the Canvas conference. And so I have to have 
a canvas sugi that has a password of like canvas pandas love, you know, we love pandas or whatever the password will be on those servers. Um, and so that allows me to sell and promote Sugi and Aperio in general at all these other conferences. I also started meeting some tool vendors that uh, wanted to uh, use Sakai as a test endpoint. And so I've got this one Sakai server that's sort of out of our normal QA process that I can upgrade and watch and let these tool vendors have accounts on so that they can test LTI Advantage tools inside Sakai, because Sakai has one of the cleanest and easiest to understand uh, LTI Advantage implementations. And so for them, they can kind of see what their job is, and there's lots of debugging. You can pause it, and you can do all these things, mostly because I'm a nerd, and I wrote all that code, and I want to be able to debug my own code. So this helps people like Adobe test their tools with Sakai, which again, gives us an advantage in interoperability. If we're the test harness for these folks, our, their tools will work with us nicely. Another use case that's starting to dawn on me is a thing I've got to do, is that I mentioned that LTI 1.1 tools are completely irresponsible. They're going to get worse, not better, most of them with LTI 1.3, because most of these vendors consider LTI as a checkbox on your RFQs. And if they got a thing that passes certification, no matter how badly they implemented it, if it passes certification, they will tell you to, to just shut up if you want a feature changed, right? We passed certification. We made certification too easy is what we did. So these folks are really lazy, like Piazza, for example. Those folks, lazy. Just LTI, sure, whatever you want. Here's your LTI, just shut up. I don't, you know, don't complain to me about LTI. It's, a lot of them aren't even certified, let alone certified and functioning badly. So these folks are pretty lazy. So what I want to build them is a way for them to drop an almost headless Sugi in and then, and then take all these launches from LTI 1011. I'm getting rid of LTI 2.0, uh, LTI Advantage and Google, and Google Classroom, and then convert those into LTI 1.1 advantages. Because one of the things that I did between Sugi and Sakai that is, I think, state of the art is the transition, handling the transition from LTI 1.1 to LTI Advantage. You, in Sakai, which I'll talk about tomorrow, Sakai is the only LMS that you can have a tool that is fully provisioned with LTI 1.1 security and a fully provisioned with LTI 1.3 security and a little checkbox that says, do the launch in LTI 1.3. Launch, 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 launch. Do the launch in LTI 1.1. Launch, 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 launch. Do the launch in LTI 1.3. Launch, 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 launch. Nobody else can do that. Sugi can go back and forth smoothly. The reason the other vendors can't do this is because they are, at the same time they're going from LTI 1.1 to LTI 1.3, they're moving to a uh, SaaS security model. So there'll be one private key for every Blackboard client. There'll be one private key. So the key and secret of LTI 1.1, there's going to be one private key no matter how many Blackboard schools there are. They'll, they'll share the same public-private key. And, uh, and so what happens is, is that user IDs that used to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 at the University of Michigan and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 at UCLA, uh, they can't be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 anymore because they're actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Canvas. And so there's this complex transition for those, those LMSs that are going to pure software as service, right? And so a lot of LMSs are going to not do software as a, not allow you to do anything but software as a service. There'll be no self-hosting, et cetera, et cetera, and LTI Advantage is going to be only implemented, there'll be no self-hosting of any product that does LTI Advantage, because they've actually pulled some of the security mechanisms right outside the product. Sakai and Moodle actually don't do that. Sakai and Moodle actually still respect the notion that some school, or like the federal government, might be behind a firewall and can't just use the security credentials of Canvas. Well, whatever. All this stuff is a mess. Transition is a mess. I figured this stuff all out. These tools can be lazy, throw up one little server that gateways all this crap, deals with secret management, and then hands them a good old-fashioned LTI 1.1 launch, which lets them be, continue to be completely irresponsible. So one of my tasks for this summer, I have never spoken a kind word about Caliper until, at least not in public, until today. Um, I have decided that I found a use case for Caliper. Um, it's not necessarily the same use case of spying on poor little children and seeing if their eyeballs are like looking toward the teacher all day. 
Uh, I hate artificial intelligence. I completely agree with Ian's talk this morning. I'm going to use it for logging of like errors and stuff and letting people who own apps inside of Sugi to see their own errors or see their own usage or teachers to see stuff, et cetera. So I'm going to build it. I'm going to build a simple Python Django based uh, learning record store. It will be able to forward to other learning record stores and but it'll have some analytics and some visualization and I'll just start sending Caliper data. I have some visualization and analytics inside of Sugi. I'm going to pull that out and re-implement that over here in Django and then I'm going to make it so that those, those that caliper data in, that's visualized currently inside Sugi is visualized here, and then I'm going to add more. And it's also an experiment for me to get to moving toward Postgres and Django from PHP and MySQL. So, sort of taking stock of where we are five years. At five years, we're really approaching what I think of as a 1.0 release. Classic nerd, right? The first release is 0.001, and the next release is 0.002, and, and you go for years and years and years, and maybe if you're really feeling good, you go 0.10 as the release. So when I say 1.0 release, I'm like, it's kind of done. I mean, it's not like barely there, it's kind of done. Uh, the last two tasks that I have is um, remove the LTI 2.0 support from Sugi. All the other vendors are getting rid of that have LTI 2, which is Blackboard and Canvas. Can Blackboard has it fully, Canvas has it partially. They're ripping LTI 2 out as fast as possible. I'm going to rip LTI 2 out of Sakai this summer just because I like the feeling of deleting code because it's really easy to write a test plan for deleting code. It's much harder to write a test plan for new code than it is for getting rid of 10, 12,000 lines of really ugly, nasty code. Now, LTI 2.0 was an ugly, nasty specification. I tried to warn them, they didn't listen to me, and now it's dead. I'm going to do some caliper stuff. I got solid and scalable commercial hosting for the PHP thing. I like to think of my moment in time as like Apache 1.0, right? Good product. Everybody knows can use it. Stable, won't break, just chug along. It's not very sexy, but whatever. So that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at today. But it seems to me that no matter where I'm at, no matter how sure I am that I'm done, all I know is when I finish a journey, that means that the next journey just has presented itself to me. And so this is a bit of a preview of tomorrow morning's keynote that I'm going to be giving. And uh, without really intending to, I now am the teacher of the world's largest programming class. I graduate more new programmers than probably the top 20 universities combined at this point. And I graduate them all in Python. I didn't plan on that. It's pretty awesome. Coursera, it makes it so that I can have a race car and sponsor this conference from Coursera Money. So that's nice. Um, and I went to India, courtesy of Coursera. And uh, in this very room, which is Accenture in uh, Mumbai, I had a, an awakening. And I asked this room three questions. I asked the room, how many people have learned Python from me? And half the room raised their hands because the other half had learned Python from somebody else. I said, that's cool. I said, I got a PHP class. How many people want to learn PHP? And like three people back there raised their hand. And I said, how many people want to learn Django from me? And every single hand in the room went up. And I'm like, PHP is a bad idea. I spent five years to build the greatest PHP framework I could imagine. I built an entire specialization called Web Applications for Everybody that's on Coursera. It's actually doing pretty well, not as well as the Python. And so I'm like, crap, nobody wants to learn PHP. Nobody under 35 years old wants to learn PHP because they all know Python and they just want to use Python. And I'm like, I give up. So now I'm teaching a class called Django for Everybody, and this will be a specialization probably after the first year on Coursera, and I think it could be more successful as a specialization than my Python class. And the reason is, is the most queried term on Coursera's website is Python, but there are a ton of Python classes. The most queried term on Coursera's website for which they don't have a class is Django. The most queried term on Coursera's site for which they don't have a class is Django. So I will be probably the first massively open online course on Django. And like everything I do, I'll use Sugi, I'll use Coseo, it'll be open educational resources, it'll be on Coursera, it'll be on edX, 
and everywhere on the planet will be learning Django. So if I were to build an open source learning management system today, if we just didn't have what we've got, if you think back to how we, how did we end up with Java? Well, this whole thing started in 2002, which is a long time ago. What we did is we were university people. We were smart university people at schools that had smart developers. So University of Michigan, you look around, well, we got Java people, really good Java people. Java people were $250,000 in Silicon Valley, right? But we had like four of them, and they're kind of bored. So we said, well, let's like make an open source thing in Java. We got all these talent. They're kind of bored. They got nothing to do when we would take control of our own world. Then I start flying around to places, and I come into Cambridge, and they're like, oh, that's kind of interesting stuff. And then I'm talking to Ian Boston, like, and he's a really advanced Java developer that's totally underutilized. I'm like, why don't you help us? And I did this over and over and over in 2003, 2004, 2005. I would go into a university, and I realized they have a bunch of really great Java developers, right? And with that, we, we swept up the excess capacity of Java developers at leading universities. The problem is, how, many, how much excess capacity of Java developers do we have at universities right now? Zero. No excess capacity of Java developers. Okay? As a matter of fact, most universities have almost no excess capacity of developers at all. And nobody under 35 is learning Java. And if you look at our contributors, there's no one under 35. And in five years in Sakai, there will be no one under 40. And in five more years, there'll be no one under 45. It's pretty easy to calculate this, right? There are no new Java developers being made. And if they are, they're not going to work on open source. So if we were starting today and we are trying to create an open source community, we would use Python. Canvas's success is because they used Ruby on Rails. Ha ha, joke's on them. That was a bad choice. If they were smart, they would throw it all away and they would start writing in Django, but you know they're not going to do that. So what I'm going to do, you could call this Sugi Ultra. That gives it like a great chance of failure. Although this Blackboard Ultra is kind of finding its way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly but surely take pieces and re-implement them in Django. And I'm just going to take, in my spare time, I'm going to slowly but surely take it to the point to see how far I can build a completely parallel Django environment to my PHP environment. I'm going to talk to the exact same database, meaning that you could run in production a Django version of Sugi and a PHP version of Sugi and not change the database. What I'll tend to do once this gets to a certain point is I will resist putting new features into the PHP version, and I'll do them in Django. I've done some initial comparisons, and I think I can write this code ultimately will be one-third the size of my PHP code because I can do so much so fast in Django that I actually did by hand in PHP that's fully automated in Django. So I'll move this up. And who knows? In two years, I might end up with Django, and then I would switch to Postgres. I'm kind of getting tired of MySQL. I think that Oracle's ownership of MySQL is going to become more and more onerous in the MySQL space. And I'm also teaching an online class on Postgres, too. So I've kind of walked away from MySQL. And, and uh, so I could imagine that some future Tsugi, perhaps in two years, would be all Django-based, and it would be Postgres-based. That would be a big conversion. But in the short term, I will not convert the database, and I will make sure that the Django code talks in the exact same way. Now, that's not the same as what I'm doing in terms of the Django code that hides behind this web service. Where the, but eventually, what I will do is I will take the PHP tools and hide them behind that same web service, which then isolates them from a security and from a data perspective. It will be isolated, just like Django. I could write no Java, Scala, who the heck cares, because each one of these little bits of shim code was going to be super tiny, super tiny. It's all best on, based on a simple REST RPC-style web services. For those of you who've been around a long time, this is kind of like a web service building block, which is not an interop interoperability standard, but instead it's just an API for tools to run in one environment. So if you're going to write in my, I call these T blocks, Sugi blocks, 
then you're talking to the SUGI API, and SUGI's taking care of all these weird, crazy, and all these uh, things coming down the pike. Same thing if I can get Django to become my thin uh, to LTI 1.1 proxier, you know, I'll just, just that'll be just, you'll, it'll, the Django code will take all these launches, it'll transform them, and then legacy tools can hide just, they won't even notice, they'll hide behind PHP, and then if I give them a Django version in two years, they'll hide behind Django, and they'll never notice, because this now is not a proprietary API, that's LTI 1.1, which is kind of like the previous generation API. Now, for those of you who have adopted SUGI PHP, how many, show of hands, how many people adopted SUGI PHP? Yeah, that's kind of what I expected. David. So th I'll talk to you, David. So David is probably a little nervous, because David's doubling down on SUGI PHP. And very few others are, but there are others. Um, SUGI PHP is going to be around forever. I have so much code in SUGI PHP. All my MOOC infrastructure, all my learning object repositories, everything is SUGI PHP. It's going to run for years and years and years. And by the time I'm ready to convert my stuff, your stuff will convert too. <laughs> right? And so there's no reason to worry about it. This, this Django Python, that allowing Django applications is far easier than rewriting it all in Django. And by the time I switch to, I, I've got this Django rewrite done, it'll have been so sort of quiet and boring. It'll be like IPv6, right? Like, you hear about it forever, and then by the time it comes, it's like, well, d did we do it? I guess it started to work. And so that's what this is. And it's kind of like how I felt when Apache went from 1 to 2. And so from, from Sugi 1 to Sugi 2 will be this long, very slow, very gentle, very informed process, and Sugi PHP will be rock solid and awesome all the while. So. In the short term, Tsugi, PHP, and Koseyu are adoptable, scalable, and I'm going to clean up documentation. I'm going to write better tutorials. I'm not like walking away from these. What I really want them to do is to be able to colonize the space with really good practice and let people do cool stuff like Dayton and others and get app stores to be a normal thing and then make it so you can write Django apps, but really they depend completely on PHP for their sort of runtime environment. Um, this whole little Sugi Django, that's the, that's the lightweight web service thing. That's the T blocks, the, the Sugi building blocks. Um, that's going to be my main message for this summer, that Sugi PHP is stable. And if you really want to learn and you aren't already a skilled PHP skill, go ahead and write Django. And I think that David, at some point, you might want to play with this, right? And, and then you'll influence what that thing is. Right now it's really simple, but you might find it's easier to find developers that are young, that are 19, that want to actually work in Django rather than PHP. And, just, and so I don't know, do you, do you find that, David? Um, probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, well, we'll find out. We'll talk. I mean, this evo evolution will be done all in the open. Um, I believe that ultimately this Sugi Caliper re record store, I think we'll find ways to use it in Sakai ultimately. I really do. I think we'll find ways to add statistics to Sakai. Um, and um, in the long term, I have this idea, which you sort of saw on that slide that, that went away, that it's time to build the world's last LMS, otherwise known as the LMS that's going to disrupt Canvas. And I think that if there's any LMS that could disrupt Canvas, other than maybe Google Classroom and, and or Microsoft Teams, um, I think it's going to be a Python-based LMS. I think it's going to have a lot less code. I think it's going to be more headless. Um, and and I'm, on, I'm on this project where I'm, Sugi is part of this project, but but it's called LibreText, which is an open source textbook that's a wiki. And he wants to put homework into the wiki, and he wants to put tracking into the wiki, and it's not his wiki. It's like a commercially hosted wiki from a company that barely listens to him. And he wants to turn a wiki into a learning management system, but it's really just a static web page. But the only trick he's got is it's a static web page hosted on a domain that he owns, LibreText.org. So it's like a commercial product with a domain he owns. So all his tricky stuff 
is sneak a little JavaScript into the top of it. Hypothesis, for example, is sneaking in on top of it by just layering some JavaScript, which of course means you're pretty trusting of hypothesis at that point. But you can back off a bit and you start thinking about LTI 1.3, you start thinking about SUGI, you start thinking about the ability to use LTI as a roster retriever, not necessarily a UI launcher, but a roster retriever. And then you start thinking about a SAML-based single sign-on system between sort of campus assets and these external assets, maybe within common. And we somehow can figure out who CSEV at umich.edu is through in common at this sort of far destination website through SAML. And then we somehow can talk to University of Michigan's Canvas and pull down the rosters and then ask that student sitting on the top of this web page in an overlay what class they're really in and now setting a cookie so they're in the class so course to course navigation happens in a wiki page that you don't even own and then all of a sudden you're in, a, you're in XYZ course from ABC school and homework pops up and hovers over top of the wiki and there's all caliper going on there's LTI launches to homework systems and ultimately it means that this wiki system can, in a sense, take over completely from a learning management system. You basically have a link called leave in the learning management system and a link called gradebook. And then the wiki does all the wiki system and the overlays on top of the wiki system. And CAS do all the hard work. And I, I told him I'd build that this time next year. I already did, because I think I can. And, it, and this is where LTI Advantage is going to be so massively disruptive because it's going to turn learning management systems into student information systems with a protocol that every single learning management system is aggressively implementing and is going to force people to use, except it is the ultimate end of the learning management system as a form that we've known it for 25 years. LTI advantage. So this is a moment of disruption, and I'm going to let Sugi sort of wander through this space and be the tool that is the new LMS that layers on top of other things rather than being an LMS that just sits in one place and the data is becomes free. So, and that's why I call this kind of idea and project the last LMS, right? It's the, it's the, Sugi's always been what's next, but now it's the last LMS that we'll ever build. So, that's it. I got, how much time I got? Some, any questions? I got seven minutes. Any questions? We got a microphone. Any questions? Is this thing on? It is. Any questions? Any comments? Yeah, but not on the recording. Okay, noted. You have another last LMS story, I'm sure. Any, any other comments? Okay then, uh, we'll stop the recording so we can have the real conversation. And uh, thanks for listening and uh, see you at lunch. <laughs>